All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Ben Climber Presents. What am I presenting today? I am presenting vintage Rolex. Uh, and with me, I've got a longtime friend and great member of the, the, the Rolex and Greater Watch community, Mr. Jeff Hess, uh, who is now with Sotheby's here in, in New York as the head of watches for the Americas. That sounds like a good job. Great job. So you Super play with happy. watches all day? All day long. And so, so working, working at Sotheby's, you, you, you previously were with Analog Shift, uh, previously with Philips, you know, kind of have a, a long and storied successful career in, in watches. How does Sotheby's differ from, from both of those places and, and what made you kind of jump into to Sotheby's? In large part, well, first of all, I'll say I had a great experience at Analog Shift and a great experience at Philips. Yeah. I learned a tremendous amount. Um, and I think in particular, my experience at Philips enabled me um, to be ready for the job that I have now. Again, the, the head of watches for the Americas at Sotheby's. Um, throughout my life, I've always been somebody who's liked to build things. Um, and I think um, the Sotheby's opportunity allows me to use those skills um, and to help work with a bigger team in sort of a bigger shop. Um, so I'm having a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun growing a team and sort of contributing to some of the managerial decisions um, around what sales we should have, when we should have them. Um, and so it just provided a new opportunity for me. That, that's really amazing. Um, so t today I would say I've asked you here not only because of your role with Sotheby's, but also you know, your, your role in the greater context of, of the watch world. And you are the founder and, and host of something called Roly Fest. What is Roly Fest? So Roly Fest, uh, I, if I had to give you a topic sentence, I would say it's about shared passion and community. Okay. In a nutshell, in 2019, I took it upon myself to host a global watch gathering. I called it Roly Fest. It was a made up sort of fun term. Yeah, I get that. Um, yeah. And we had about 110 people from about 15 countries come from all over the world. Um, we rented the intrepid aircraft carrier and had dinner there. Um, and people brought their watches uh, the next day to a hotel. Um, and I, it was really warmly received. And I decided I wanted to do it again. Yeah. Unfortunately, the pandemic put a uh, hold sure. on that. Finally, sort of took the bull by the horns and said, let's do it again. So a few weeks ago, we hosted Roly Fest 2023. We had 175 people from 17 countries across the globe. We had a big dinner under the whale in the American Museum of Natural History. That's cool. Followed by a brunch when all the watches came out uh, at the Rainbow Room right. at the top of 30 Rock. Um, really a great showing of just great watch passion. Mm -hmm. You know, the notion of values and investment, and that's something we can talk about, but the, value, the notion of values and how much things were worth were sort of put aside for a day. Yeah. And it was just a realization that uh, there is such a great community yeah. and all watch collectors love this notion of sharing passion. Um, I sort of likened it to going to a concert. If you're at home and you listen to music, yeah. you can be on your own, put your headphones on and have a very relaxing, yeah, easygoing, time, yeah. great experience. But if you go to a concert and the live band is playing and you're feeling that energy with a room full of concert goers, there's sort of nothing like it. Yeah. And I think to some degree that was replicated with Roly Fest. You had people from all over the globe coming, sharing their passion, sharing the stories, um, all their treasure hunting. And it was just a recognition that how fortunate we are to be in a community like this and to meet people and develop relationships with folks that you would not have otherwise met, right. but for this little piece of jewelry on our wrist. Yeah, and l let's talk about not necessarily the, that specific piece of jewelry on your wrist, no. but this category, which is vintage Rolex. And like when, I, when I think of you, I mean, I've known you a long time, I, I think of vintage Rolex, I think Roly Fest really kind of was, was something of kind of like a, a, a climax, of course, of, of sorts of, of the revival of vintage Rolex as a category. You know, vintage Rolex is something that really was attractive to me in the early days, kind of fell, I wouldn't say out of love with it, but started to get into other things like many of us do. And, and it has now kind of come full circle. And in many ways, like it almost feels like vintage Rolex is back. Uh, and talk to me a little bit about the genesis of the vintage Rolex market. And I'm talking proper vintage, like stuff like 6200, you know, yep. 6239, it's like really old Rolex watches versus what I think a lot of people think of today as like the neo vintage stuff, the sapphire stuff, and certainly the ceramic and, and more modern stuff. I think your analysis and your experience is really spot on. You know, when you and I 
first started collecting watches and we were on forums, even pre-Hodinkee, yeah. if you even said the word investment, it was taboo. Correct. And I think for a while, and I gave an interview about five years ago when I talked about how collectors were sort of struggling to find an equilibrium between passion and investment. Yeah. Um, and we always were taught, buy what you love, buy what you love. And years ago, if you even said the word investment, you got a slap on the wrist Correct. saying you shouldn't speak about that. It should just buy what you love and don't worry about the money. But eventually things got more and more expensive. And then it became fair to say, hey, the investment part has to be a part of the equation. Um, it would make total sense to be thinking about this. Can I sell this watch if I need to? Am I going to make money? Am I yeah. going to lose money? Is it something that's liquid? Right. And I think over the ensuing years, in particular in 21 and 22, we saw this incredible shift where the equation became really a lot about investment. And that's where I think some of the interest tailed off, perhaps for you, for me, and for others. I think we went into an environment where people started to feel like, you know, the watches are owning me. I don't own the watch anymore. Um, and how many people I heard say, you know, this isn't fun anymore. I'm, I'm done. Right. Um, and what I think we're seeing now to really answer your question is, not dissimilar from other assets, we're watching some downtrending in prices. And now what I'm seeing is real collectors coming back into the market, less speculative buying. And with that comes the person who enjoys the scholarship of a lot of the references that you've spoken about. Yeah. You know, collecting vintage Rolex is a little bit of a different experience than going to a store and buying a modern Nautilus or even a modern Rolex. Um, there's a lot of narrative, there's a lot of story, there's a lot of history. It's almost like art history. And I think that appeals most to the real collector, the true collector. Yeah. So what I'm seeing now is prices have pulled back and retreated a little bit. On contemporary watches. On contemporary watches yeah. and to some degree across the board, we're seeing the real collectors of vintage who appreciate that scholarship, who want to do that deep dive sort of coming back. And they're saying, wow, you know, prices are a little bit more reasonable now. It's, it's fun again. There's no question that the thrill of the hunt is a big part of watch collecting. Mm -hmm. And I think for a while, people felt a little bit stymied yeah. that prices got very strong for vintage Rolex or modern. And then we're also seeing something that you and I have heard over and over again for years and years and years, that if you buy the very best example you can find, you'll be well served. And if we look at results recently, there was that tremendous Milgauss that Philip sold for about $3 million, spectacular. Right. Crazy, right. Um, this past weekend, Monaco Legends sold that beautiful black um, with Tropical Dial RCO for yep. a significant fund. Sotheby's sold an incredible JPS not long ago for over $2 million, which was a record. Yep. So what, one thing that I think has not changed is that the very best examples will always command a premium. And you certainly see that with some of the, the Paul Newmans and, and, uh, and a lot of the sort of big classic references. Yeah, so I mean, let, let's, let's do what we like to do the most and like talk specifics here. So like, Please. L like let's start with the Oyster Paul Newman, Mark I, Mark II, whatever, yeah. wherever we want to end up is fine. That I kind of view as like the bellwether of vintage Rolex, right? It's the thing that like, is, I don't want to say it's the easiest under, to understand, but it's kind of the easiest to understand, right? Paul Newman War I, it's a Daytona steel it's easy you know and, and there i mean there there's enough of them out there where like there's a real market for them you know you get into 6200s and some some more obscure like kind of like micro references and it's like kind of hard to really benchmark so where is an oyster paul newman today in terms of value um it's at a significant number yeah and before i even give you a number i think it bears noting that i've always believed that the paul newman market is almost a separate market unto itself why it's as blue chip as it gets. And what's really interesting is with more and more newer collectors coming into the fold, they may not identify with the man, Paul Newman, sure. as much. And yet, for whatever reason, the Paul Newman iconic Daytona can, continues to hold its own. You're going to be hard pressed to find a screw pusher great Paul Newman for less than three or $400,000. Um, and sometimes you'll see a Mark I, you know, in tremendous condition that could theoretically be more. Yeah. So the reality is, I think that 
even if the name Paul Newman starts to become a little bit less relevant for a younger generation, the iconic design in that watch um, just has incredible staying power. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we saw, in, I don't want to say, I'm not going to call him this generation's Paul Newman, but somebody of, of equal, you know, import in Mr. Sean Carter, Jay-Z, wearing a, a Paul Newman Tiffany sign. So the fact that, like, you know, somebody that is so, so mega famous is wearing a vintage Daytona. Absolutely. I think says a lot about like the, the, the demand cycle of, of that watch. And, and Jay-Z has been buying some amazing watches these days for sure. But like to see him wearing a vintage Daytona of, of that kind of level of uh, integrity is, is, is something for sure. No doubt. Uh, so, okay. So the Paul Newmans have remained relatively, I don't want to say flat, but where, where were they at their peak? If you, if you don't mind me asking. I'm going to say there hasn't been a dramatic change. I think pumper pushers, 6239s and 6241s, mm. had a significant escalation going into the famous Phillips sale where yeah. Paul Newman's Paul Newman was sold. Um, and I saw those drift up into the mid 200s for pumper pusher watches. The truth is, they've stayed relatively close to that. Yeah. A great pumper pusher is still going to cost you that. In fact, I saw that I've seen that the gap between screw pusher and pumper pusher is actually narrowed. At right. one point, it was 2x or even 3x. Yeah. It isn't quite that way anymore. Right. Um, but the truth is, I think a pumper pusher is still going to cost you at least $250,000 for a really great example. Yeah. So it isn't a watch that's pulled back dramatically. In fact, that escalation that we saw going into the sale of the, of the, the famous Paul Newman. Um, has really largely held. Yeah, it, it almost seems like, you know, over the past few years, yourself, myself, and so many of us have been interviewed by, you know, the Bloombergs of the world, we'll call them, about the, the, the great investment potential on watches. But what they really meant is contemporary watches, like buying a Daytona at retail, and then it's worth three, four, five, at, up, upwards of five times at, at its peak, I would say. But all the while, vintage Daytona in particular kind of remained constant. Just nobody was talking about it. Yep. Does that feel right? It does feel right. And the words blue chip come to mind. Yeah. You know, to some degree, if you are thinking about values, because that's what we're discussing right now, I think you have to project yourself out 10 years from now. And there are a lot of brands, in particular independent brands, that are pushing the envelope with respect to design. And there's some incredible creativity out there. But it does beg the question, 10 years from now, will those styles and those those creative designs still be desirable. Yeah. They may or may not. Yeah. But I with, can say with confidence that 10 years from now, there will be a meaningful market for collectors that want to buy a Paul Newman Rolex Daytona. The design itself is extraordinary. Yeah. So I think recognizing that it's a blue chip to some degree, yeah. you know, I think we we love all these creative new designs and sometimes we forget that there's something to be said about these tried and true successful formulas that are that are always likely to be desirable. So let, let's kind of keep going down the hierarchy here. Big red, 6263, or just any 6263, uh, steel. Yep. Where, where, where are those these days? I think a great big red 6263 with or without box and papers is still gonna cost about a hundred grand. Right. You know. And so that might be down a little bit. Maybe. A little bit, but yeah. it doesn't mean a fantastic one wouldn't have been 120. Right. It really wasn't that long ago that we were in the 75, 80 range. Right. Um, you know, to the extent that some of the froth of the pandemic pricing has pulled back, um, even with references like that, if we're returning to sort of pre-pandemic pricing, I don't recall anybody in 2019 or 2020 saying, wow, there are bargains to be had on big red 6263s. Right. So even those um, as iconic designs, they have held their own. And a great 6263 is for sure going to cost 100000 Right. Okay. So let's jump into the, the other, I would say, you know, there are many icons on Rolex, no, no doubt. But I Definitely. would say the other pillar is the Samaritan. Right, so you're wearing a 6200 right now. I'm wearing a 6200. So, you know, arguably one of, the, not arguably, indeed one of the first uh, Submariners. Where's the submarket these days? The submarket, I think, is a little bit different. It's more of a watch for a scholar mm -hmm. because there are a lot of different iterations. We start talking about different bezels, different hands, different dial configurations, gilt dials, matte dials. I think there's a little bit of, been a little bit of a pullback on gilt watches. Why is that? Um, you know, again, I think 
to some degree, a lot of the knowledge that you and I learned from forums and um, though that is starting to go away and you don't it, you know social media has been fantastic for the watch community and we've all met so many people but some of the discourse has dissipated so st understanding and learning the nuances of gilt dials and radium loom and different hands mercedes hands and pencil hands and the different bezels and red triangles and no hash bezels that requires a different level of discourse that we don't see um, all that much on Instagram, for example. Right. So vintage collectors in particular embrace the stories and the narratives behind the watch. Um, and when I think about a Submariner, in particular a Big Crown, I think about how, how has that reference entered society? It entered society through this cultural icon called James Bond. Right. And that feeling of feeling like James Bond and having, you know, your sleeve roll up and seeing seeing that Submariner that yeah. was worn in Goldfinger and Thunderball. Mm -hmm. I think that just has never ending staying power. Yeah. So I think these the great examples of some of the rare Submariners are always going to be held in high regard and always in demand. 10 years from now, 12 years from now, a great Rolex Submariner from the 1960s is always going to be an aspirational piece. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing we think about collectors today and aspirate the word aspirational when you and I were collecting years ago if you you didn't typically start with a screw pusher mark 1 That's Panda. For sure. that was the aspirational daytona you collected a daytona and you always wanted to move up the chain and maybe you got a big maybe you started with a zenith daytona and then you moved into a 6263 big red and then when you got there, you wanted to climb that arc and you wanted a Paul Newman. And I know, I remember your pumper pusher, Paul Newman. Yeah. And then what did you want? You wanted to move up the chain even more. And your aspirational piece was the real grail, which was a Mark I um, screw pusher, Panda 6263, Paul Newman. Yeah. I'm not sure that same level of, it's the same kind of aspirations exist with the modern collector and a lot of the new collectors that have entered our hobby. You, this is why I think maybe the aspirational Daytona now is a rainbow. Mm. It's very, very different than it once was. Yeah, and, and I guess the question is, is like, you know, how, how will all of this resonate with the generation, I would say younger than us, one generation beneath us? And I think that that's the thing that I still like haven't really wrapped my head around because th there's so many guys now that guys and gals that are getting into watches and like, they're okay maybe they want a 5711 or 5811 because 5711 is out of production or a 5167 or a 16202 or maybe the, the holy grail is the rainbow or something like that do you think the james bond thing means as much to them as it does to us paul newman we agree probably does not because like he's, he's he was a real person not a character paul, james bond is around so yep. to speak do you think it resonates the same way I, it probably doesn't right but the question is um, while on one hand, it's so wonderful to see all these new people coming into our hobby. It's an explosive growth in demand. Yeah. Will, how many of them will take the time to start to become educated about the nuances that vintage brings with it? And in the absence of that, it won't be incredibly appealing. But once you get into it, it's like art history. You start getting into the different dials and the different iterations and bezels and hands, and it becomes this incredibly fascinating journey. And I have to believe that um, as the speculative buyers start to drift away a little bit because prices have pulled back, that a lot of the real true collectors, um, if I can use that expression, yep. um, will go back to appreciating and, and, and and doing the scholarship that it takes to, to start to really enjoy the, the prospect of buying old subs and old Daytonas and old GMTs. Yeah. Um, and so where, I mean, we'll just keep going through the model list. Just yeah. Because why not? Um, GMTs have always played a second fiddle to, to some Mariners, for better or worse. Where, where's that market today? Um, softer. Yeah. Definitely a retreat. Um, the interesting thing is there is a significant narrowing in the gap between gilt and matte dial. And that may actually be very relevant to what we were just discussing. Gilt dials used to be at least two, three X um, from a matte dial. I don't see that as much. 
A matte tile is easier to buy. You don't have to loop the dial yeah. to the extent you would a gilt tile. You're not worrying about spider cracks. You're not worrying about necessarily radium loom or um, so it's easier. Um, and perhaps that's why it's been more readily embraced now and the gap has narrowed. I think there are fewer people focusing on gilt GMTs than on matte dial GMTs. Um, which in a way, again, um, I hope changes over time yeah. because you and I have also gone down the road of looking at double Swiss and chapter rings and all the different crown guards. Yeah. And that's such a, that's an exciting, it's fun. It's an exciting, fun journey. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've spent hours and hours studying exclamation points <laughs> below the six and chapter rings and um, fat font bezels. And you don't have that as much with matte dials. So with matte dials, you can get the experience of vintage without having to put in quite the same level of scrutiny. Yeah. And I think we're seeing a little of that. It's a little easier. Yeah. And do you think it, it has anything to do with the fact, because if you look at the contemporary Rolex, like the Pepsi, the, the modern day GMT has quite a few variations, gold, non-gold, uh, you know, uh, Batman, Pepsi, et cetera, yeah. left hand, right hand, whatever. And so th there's like quite a bit of a market there. But on modern contemporary subs, there's like really not. There's not that many options with contemporary subs. So it's almost yep, it's sort of date or no date. Thing. Right. Yep. You know what's also, I guess, a couple of, you trigger a few, a few thoughts. The date just. Sure. So the date just is Rolex's bestseller. Sure. And why hasn't that really ever been embraced to the same degree as some of the more complicated Daytonas that we've seen, um, some of the more complicated Submariners that we've seen? And that's something you always have to think about because it's yeah. such an iconic reference. It's the date just. Winston Churchill wore a date just. Yeah. It always stood for stability and greatness and maturity. Yeah. Um, but I guess, and to some degree, it became known as the watch that your grandfather wore. Yeah. Why does the Explorer not? I mean, the Explorer is a date just with a beautiful dial. Like the Explorer is like so many guys that I know that are some of the most tasteful men in the world all wear 1016s or even contemporary explorers. Like why has there never been a million dollar explorer as far as I know? Yep, there haven't been. Right. The only explanation I can give, cause you're right, it doesn't really make sense. There's a lot of scholarship on 1016s. Um, so there's a whole lot to dive into. It can be a very interesting subject. Yeah. There are early explorers with chapter rings. There are early explorers with different loom. There are later uh, explorers. So. I always likened it to size, that 36 millimeters is still not quite a 40 millimeter steel sports model. Yeah, no bezel. No bezel. Right. Um, but it is grounded in incredible history. I mean, Sir Edmund Hillary in Tenzing, Norway, and Rolex making a watch to, to celebrate this, this great climb up yeah. a giant mountain. Incredibly cool. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, as, as as well documented, the Explorer was my first Rolex. I, I have a few of them still. Like, if you look at the really weird, freaky, you know, kind of like off the reservation example, space dwellers and white dials, and like, yep. you see these things come up at auction, it's like, like mid ones, you know, for these things. I was like, wow, yep. like if that were Samara, that'd be $3 million. You know, if that were Daytona, it'd be more than that. Yep. Uh, and it's just funny that the Explorer never really caught the wave of like the, the I don't want to say the real money because it's all real money. But like the money that is kind of like, holy shit, this is a this is a meaningfully expensive thing at this point. Same thing for the day trust. I'm not a hundred percent. I don't really have an answer for you. In yeah. a way, it's unfair. Yeah. Because you have all this history, all this story, all the different iterations. Yeah. It's as iconic as it gets. I guess I would point to size. Yeah. That 36 millimeters. For a while, especially during the real steel sports model craze, if you will, yeah. in recent years, that was all about 39 to 41 millimeter watches, yeah. 40 millimeter watches, and 36 takes a little getting used to. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, we're not here to predict the future or guarantee anybody's return on anything. But, like, to me, as I said earlier in, in the episode, like, it, it feels like sports vintage Rolex is kind of coming back to some degree. I, I even have very good friends that are like, you know, they used to own a ton of stuff, but now they're kind of dipping a toe again. I see it unequivocally. Yeah. So, I mean, so what are some of the things that you still feel are like really undervalued? I mean, we just said date just and explorers, but, but what else and what specific examples? Well, I mean, going back to GMTs, there'll always be somebody that wants an original vintage GMT. I mean, if you bought the steel ceramic GMT, eventually it seems very natural that you'd aspire to owning 
an original GMT from the 60s or for even from the 70s. So my money would still be there. My GMTs. It would be. So GMTs are the buy. GMT the buy because I think there's been a more meaningful pullback. Yeah. Subs, you might say the same. Daytonas, I feel like, are the safer play, but they haven't pulled back quite so, to so the extent. So the Daytonas would be the hold, maybe? Yeah, the Daytonas are the hold, but I would still say to somebody, by all means, if you love a, a Daytona, yeah. um, it's a safe bet. Yeah. Is, is there a sell in vintage Rolex right now? Is there something that you just think is too, too hot and overinflated? I can't think of anything that's really a sell. What will be interesting is the Milgauss, mm -hmm. the 6541. We just saw this incredible example sell for $3 million. Right, which is like a one-off result, right? We one-off result, that correct. But it takes two to tango. Right. So we do know that there is now um, a new spotlight placed on 6541s. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens, even in this coming auction season. Right. Um, what will happen with those watches? Those are super rare. Yeah, but I mean, how, like, how, how do you actually in your, in your new role? It's other like, how would if somebody came in with a similar watch to the one that Philip sold for whatever it was, three million dollars? What would your estimate be on that watch? You couldn't go anywhere near there, of course. I'd still take a con more conservative route. It may sound funny to say that, but I think you know a Milgauss to six five four one. It's better to play it safe and say. Traditionally, that was always a very rare watch, very hard to come by. I never had the ability to own one. They were always out of reach. Um, but I would probably say an estimate would be two hundred to 400000 Right. So, I mean, a fraction of what A that fraction was. of what it was. Yeah. And I think like that, that's the thing that I think is so confusing to vintage Rolex, is right? like the, these, these like seemingly trivial differences make a difference of... 10x, and it, let's say in this case of, of, of Milgauss. Yep. Uh, and that, that, I'm sure you can understand, is scary to people. It is. Well, look, in the case of the Milgauss, it wasn't a good seller when it was, or when it originally left the factory. Right. And like any other normal company, it didn't sell well and they sold less. Yeah. Fast forward years later, it's the same thing with Paul Newman dials. Right. Those were poor sellers. Right. You know, dealers ended up. Swapping dials out because yeah. they couldn't sell the exotic Look, dial. In, in in many ways, like the original Rainbow was a really poor seller as well. You know, it's it's not so uncommon with Rolex to, to see that happen. Um, so, what's exciting you in vintage Rolex these days? Um, as a person. Look, I've always been a uh, a gilt Submariner collector. Yeah. Um, I love the history. It really, to me, it is the epitome of greatness when it comes to dive watch. Um, so many brands have their own version of a dive watch, and I view the Submariner as absolutely the gold standard. Um, some of the early small crowns, I mean, having a 6204, I, I don't like using the word important when it comes to watches. I think we overuse that in the industry a little bit, that watches generally, in my view, aren't really important. Um, except in rare instances. And a 6204, for example, it's the very first Submariner. Sure. That is the birth of the dive watch yeah. by Rolex. That is just, that's astonishing. How important would you feel to have the very first Submariner? It had pencil hands, it had a unique bezel. Yeah, totally a good point. Um, I feel that way about the 6200. It's why I think this watch is so extraordinary. Um, so I think early subs are still a great passion for me, um, and I'm just a big believer in them. There's so much history there, and there, yeah. there's so much to understand. Yeah. Um, so yeah. you know, the, the the last guest that we had last week's episode was was, was with Ferdy Porsche, and you know, I, I think in many ways I view Porsche as the Rolex of cars. Right? You have these iconic designs. The 911, in my opinion, is the Submariner or Daytona of of cars. And you see these kind of this incremental change of like the 911 today looks a hell of a lot like the 911 from from 1964. What what is it about Rolex that that feels so similar in, in that way? One of the things that I've always loved about Rolex as a company and as a brand is their steadfast practice um, to ensure that changes are done incrementally. Mm. Um, it's really always been an evolution and not a revolution. Yeah. You very rarely see big radical changes. In truth, it's one of the reasons why the new emoji Rolex is so crazy. sort of so crazy because yeah. people can't believe that Rolex actually did that. They I really went, cannot believe that. They went off the yeah. beaten path. Yeah. It's so unusual for them. But typically, 
Rolex takes these tried and true iconic formulas, their Daytonas, their GMTs, their Submariners, and they do very minor tweaks, very gradual incremental changes. So in a way, it, it feels very safe also because you know Rolex isn't gonna go way off the beaten path except in very rare instances. It's yeah. always these small incremental changes. And I think that's why you see a lot of these references have staying power over decades, not years, but generations. Um, I mean, the modern sub doesn't look that dramatically different than the sub from 1960. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll ask you, who, you know, a, a friend who I consider a real expert here, the same kind of questions I asked Ferdy last week about you know, his family's company. So you know, he's, he's driven every car. Uh, made by Porsche, effectively, and you know his answer to what what do you think is is kind of the ultimate modern Porsche was the nine eleven R nine nine one R, which is you know a, a car that came out ten years ago roughly. Um, what is your greatest Rolex ever made? Having owned so many of them, and if you haven't owned them, you've, you've certainly been around them in your career at Analog Shifts and Phillips, and, and certainly Sotheby's. Vintage as well. You're yeah. saying the greatest. Yeah. I think for me it would be a big crown Submariner. Yeah. Any particular reference or? Um, 6538s, 5510s. Yeah. It's the watch that James Bond wore. I hate to kind go back to more, that. Yeah. Look, how many, how many guys always aspired to be that James Bond character? Yeah. You know, cool and calm in the face of danger, yeah. um, relaxed under pressure, yeah. um, suave and debonair. And, you know, that notion of his wearing a white dinner jacket in. Thunder in uh, Goldfinger and yeah. using a Zippo lighter to look at the time. Yeah. Super cool. That's so for me, one. I think that's the watch that resonates most for me personally. Got it. And is there a contemporary or more recent Rolex that, that really is attracted to you? We'll say from the 80s through today. The new Le Mans Daytona? Yeah. Spectacular. Yeah. You, you haven't seen it yet, but actually in the episode with Freddie Porsche, we both actually plead into the camera to, to get that watch. Yes. To, to well, let me plead into the camera. Yeah. I want that watch too. <laughs> yeah. um, desperately want it. Yeah. Um, fantastic. And again, it really represents Rolex sort of embracing this notion of vintage designs. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a change where Rolex says, hey, we recognize yeah. Um, that there's a big collector community out there that loves these things, yeah. and we're gonna we're gonna work with that a little bit. Yeah, that's absolutely. very exciting, and I think that's why the vintage community is all lusting after that watch. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, so tell us a little bit as we wrap up here about what to expect from Sotheby's, and then also what to expect from from Roly Fest, if there is something to expect. Um, well, I'll take it in reverse order. Yeah. Um, definitely want to do another Roly Fest. It was a great, proud moment. You know, it, it does bear noting. We always talk about values of watches. And this year at Roly Fest, when I stood there in front of 175 people from all over the world, I really realized, as corny as it sounds, there is such value in the community yeah. and such value in the relationships um, that are made. You had people from all walks of life um, connecting. And I always like to say that watches don't just tell time, they connect people. And I think the vintage Rolex community is particularly special in that regard, that people flew all over the world to be in a room together. And I think about the value and the way in which that community has enriched my life. And I'd say we spend a lot of time talking about dollar values of watches, and we shouldn't forget that the value in the relationships that we make um, can be just enormously enriching, whether that's just on a friendship level or people you end up doing business with, which I certainly have done. Yep. So Roly Fest, definitely going to do it again, um, probably 2025. Got it. Takes probably not this year. Yeah. Um, it's an enormous undertaking. It's really almost a year to plan, but there will definitely be another Roly Fest in America. It could be that there's another Rolly Fest outside of America at some point in 2024. Thinking about that, working on a few ideas. Um, Sotheby's, I think we're rolling into a super exciting auction season. A great combination of modern watches, independent watches, and some great vintage as well. Um, I'm largely responsible um, for working on uh, the December 7th New York sale. Um, live in New York, and 
I think you're going to see some a, a breadth of pieces, some incredible vintage Rolex, um, some fantastic high complications from Independence, some terrific vintage paddock. I think you're going to. I think there's going to be something for everyone, um, and super exciting. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. Cool, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll talk soon. Super happy to be here. Thank you for having me.